Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Leveraging Video for Instruction and Assessment in Math. We're very excited to have Juan Bernal and Kelly Spoon, who are math faculty at Mesa College here today. They are incredibly busy. Uh, as we were getting started for today's session, Juan was running across campus from a panel that he was on, and Kelly has been teaching since 8 a.m. this morning. So um, as we know, you know, when 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 folks are good at what they're at what they do, they're asked to do a lot. And so I want to acknowledge that um, them sharing with us today is 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 just we're very fortunate to have this this time with them today. And I'm really excited. This is an opportunity for us to actually take a peek into asynchronous online math courses. Uh, we get a lot of demand, a lot of interest from folks about seeing what how faculty are teaching math asynchronously online. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass things over to our presenters now and welcome Kelly and Juan to get started with the session. Sorry, hold on Juan, I gotta find my share screen again. No worries. Go. Looks good. And then Michelle, you saw that comment in the the chat that they don't seem to have the ability to chat with everyone. I don't know if that was. Oh, just... I'll I'll work on that right now. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So, uh, hello everyone. My name is Juan Bernal. I teach math here. I'm a math faculty at San Diego Mesa College. I'm also the STEM professional development coordinator for HSI Title III grant. I'm part of Mesa's online student success teams, and I'm also the co-coordinator for Puente. So, uh, and this is my partner Kelly. My colleague. Hi, I'm Kelly. I also teach math. Um, I, I have I have a list of stuff too, but the most important thing is that Juan and I are both on our, our online success team. So that that is one of the things we do besides teach math together. Um, so yes, as Michelle said, we're going to be talking a little bit about how Juan and I use math, uh, video in our online math courses and our on-site courses as well. Um, but especially, okay, good, we got the chat fixed. So please introduce yourself in the chat now that you have the ability to. Um, I also, before the chat blows up, I put a link in the chat to some shared notes. Um, as Michelle said, we really encourage you to share resources and your own ideas in the chat, but it can be hard to go back and find the thing that someone said when there's a, a lot going on in the chat. And then after the section, after <clears throat> the actual session, if you haven't saved the chat in some way, like a giant copy paste, uh, sometimes that seems like it's lost forever. So my hope is that if we are all in these shared notes, we sort of have the ability to um, help be resources for each other uh, in this space. So if you decide there's something you want to know more about, you could even, you could just say uh, appearance, like peer feedback or something like that. And then if someone else has a resource, Juan and I, of course, will go in and add our resources as well. But if you have a resource, you could add it too. So there's no shortage. That's why I made the resources section a bullet point so that you could have multiple people giving multiple resources here. Um, we also put in spaces for you to take notes that are communally. So if you have a takeaway or an idea to use in your course, you can go ahead and put that into the notes as well. And then we have a, finally a link to the presentation slides at the very end. Uh, and so if there's any other resources that come up as we're chatting, we'll be sure to give you those links uh, in this shared notes as well. And it's so great to see everybody popping off in the chat. Nice yes. to meet you. All righty, everyone. So uh, we're going to be talking about three different things when it comes to video. Uh, the first thing that we're going to be focusing on is video for content. So how we do we create our lecture videos? What kind of software do we use? Uh, especially with math, you know, uh, what are some of the techie stuff that we can do and something that's maybe not as low tech. And then we're going to dive into videos for assessments. So how do we go ahead and, and use uh, assessment for uh, videos for these types of uh, exams and maybe some sort of classwork, some sort of discussion boards, and then videos for feedback. So uh, stay tuned for each one. So let's go to the next one. Videos for instruction, yes. All right. <laughs> so before we start off, uh, I do want to go up to our audience uh, just to kind of have a little bit of interaction with you guys. Uh, Kelly and I are not very much of a speaker uh, fully on, a, on an entire presentation, but uh, what do we what we do want to ask you guys is what type of technology are you currently using for video lectures? So feel free to use the chat below, and then we're going to take a look at, you know, let's see what... 
Ahí decía que can say that. I was going to say, I'm over here frantically Googling pen opto. I know. I have no idea what that was. That is a, a type of lecture share or lecture capture tool. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going to write that one down. I actually didn't know about that one. And I'm going to jump in real quick and just remind folks that if you want everyone to see your responses, you can now toggle yeah. the blue button over to everyone in the chat. You have that option now. Thanks, Michelle. <coughs> All right, perfect. Did Screencast-O-Matic get renamed? Now I have to Google more things. Yes, it did. It did? Oh. Okay, all right. I like this. We're getting, I like that we're getting both like video tools and then like tools for annotation or sharing of content. Mm -hmm. Very nice. All right. Very nice. Okay. And feel free to keep sharing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I've ended up in terms of creating lecture videos as you guys continue to share. Um, I have tried things like Canvas Studio, OBS, um, and sort of landed on for the ease of use Screencast-O-Matic, which is now apparently ScreenPal. Uh, it is still Screencast-O-Matic on my computer because I have the like paid $25 a year one that I downloaded uh, so that I can upload multiple videos at once. Uh, if you're making short, fast videos, like I, it's kind of like a must have to be able to upload the fat five minute video you just made and not wait while you're making the next five minute video. Um, and then a lot of you have brought up how we are doing the writing uh, in these lectures. because That's such a, a key part of what we do in, as, in, as math instructors is sort of annotate um, a question so we can do that reading apprenticeship piece of it. Um, and so I used to use Drawboard uh, for PDF annotation with some lecture notes. I've tried OneNote, um, but I think the pandemic broke me a little bit in that using Jamboard in my classes for like quickly bringing in stuff uh, has, has sort of landed where I'm at now, where I'm like, I do my lectures in Jamboard because if I decide I want to pull in a Desmos screen and annotate it on the fly, I can just screenshot it and throw it in and not have to worry about flattening the image or doing any of the stuff I'd have to do in OneNote to be able to write on it. Um, so that's sort of where I've been in terms of my video is now leaning heavy on Jamboard for just the writing and uh, Screencast-O-Matic for my recording. I'm going to keep muting myself because I do have a light cough. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, for me, I've kind of been transitioning a lot uh, with what, what type of writing tool I use. Um, here are two examples, but I've always been a Screencast-O-Matic freak. I've always loved that idea of just being able to use that. So I've been doing it from the very beginning when I started teaching online classes uh, back in 2018. Um, so, uh, but in terms of the uh, the writing tool that I've been using, uh, I started off with an IPVO, so I, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later, which is basically a document camera. Uh, I started off with that, but then uh, because I have a really fancy computer with my Surface Book, uh, I used a form of PDF editor where I'm, uh, you can see it on the right hand side where, with the colors. So I started using that, but then I slowly transitioned um, to OneNote just because with, with the pandemic, I started building a lot of my, my notes. I started writing everything. I know how to lay text. So I know how I was one, trying to use all those skills that I've learned before uh, on that. So I was using uh, OneNote because it has a lot of really cool things. One thing that PDF editor couldn't do was highlight for some reason, uh, at least not my version, it couldn't do it. Um, so when I went to OneNote, it was a lot easier to work with. I can highlight, I can do a lot of really great things. Um, and just using Screencast-O-Matic just in general. Um, so I did use to use online whiteboards um, and now you have to pay for some of them. So, uh, but I, I, and I always wanted to use uh, Jamboard, but for some reason I've always um, liked the idea of having OneNote, which I saw which a lot of people were using in the chat saying that they use OneNote and also Screencast-O-Matic. So that's kind of where I've been at. I've slowly been transitioning from document camera to PDF editor to now OneNote and, and Screencast-O-Matic, so. And, and I will say, Juan, I actually think you're you're better off. OneNote, you can organize everything. There's a whole OneNote classroom where you could have all of that in a, a space for your students with all your beautiful like LaTeX and all that, and then have your students be able to have a collaborative space also. Um, I just, every time I write in it, I, I get annoyed because I don't have a nice PDF that like things are moving. So right, yeah, good. yeah. And seeing all that beautiful Calc 3 stuff and right there on the on the left-hand side, it's right, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> um, so there's something that you must have with video lectures. So uh, something that I've done, 
a lot has been humanizing. So I did take uh, last semester an online humanizing STEM um, for mainly for STEM faculty members. So, and I've been using it a lot in, in two different ways. So uh, especially in my asynchronous class, the homepage, I have a little video of myself introducing myself, who I am, just so that they can students can have an idea of what I look like. Because I think sometimes we lose that type of interaction just so that they can see my face. Uh, they know who the voice, be, uh, the voice, uh, the face behind the voice in, the, in, the, in all the videos. Um, so I, I, every every if you go into my Canvas homepage, uh, that's the first thing that you see. You do see a, a video of me just welcoming all the students before they get into their into their lectures or or the material. Um, one of the things that I started doing uh, this semester, uh, actually during uh, my winter intercession class, I at, at the beginning of every module, I would have a little video, as you can see right below it, uh, where I kind of like a quick check in, kind of saying, "Hey, how are you doing?" I know the material can be a little bit. It's uh, difficult in the in the previous one, but right now we're going to slow down, kind of just giving them a little preview of what exactly is going to happen. Um, what I tend to do also is I also have a little written stuff on the bottom. Uh, so I did do give it to them in writing in case they don't want to see the video. But I mean, most of them like that feeling of like, OK, he's here with me. You know, it seems like I'm um, I'm traveling with them during this class. So just being able to humanize them. And they also, uh, one of the things that I want you to just keep in mind when you do either lecture videos or just these little small snippets is just try to keep them short. Um, I think that we're so, we wanna just say so many different things um, in one video, but I think just keep them short and sweet. That's gonna be probably something that you must have in your video lectures. So humanize, keep them short. You know, I put them in my homepage and I put them on uh, at the beginning of every module, so. Yeah, so I'll note one difference between uh, Juan and I's videos is Juan does not do the talking head like in the corner. I, I do, uh, but that's because like Juan has his face in other places and a bunch of other places. I tend to have my face also in every overview uh, page, but then if I can, uh, I have my my picture there. And I think actually, let me go back a screen or two to show you really quick. Um, I've started adding Easter eggs, so and you can barely see it, but like on top of my fridge, there's a little Spider Man uh action figure from my son so i've started adding those in the background just to give my students something to look for as i make videos um so we do need to talk especially because we have bob and i think cheryl too here uh and i did a a webinar on accessibility like two weeks ago for at one um if we're making lecture videos we do need to make sure that we are captioning them and that they have accurate captioning that's required we don't have to, we're not supposed to wait until a student gives us an accommodation letter. Um, YouTube in Kansas City uh, Studio will create captions, right? Even if we don't click a button, students can, can request them, especially in Canvas Studio. Uh, they won't necessarily be accurate, um, but you can go in and, and fix those. Um, I will say that the one place that doesn't is Canvas's like embedded video editor. Like there's a way to add, you can like click and add video in Canvas, especially in the like feedback area that does not have any captioning so um just be wary of using that i i prefer to embed from youtube uh as opposed to using even even canvas studio because i never know how long we're going to keep getting funding for that but I'm sure they'll help us transition stuff over uh if you wanted a little overview do they do they because i like last time we asked about this in the accessibility webinar and everyone was like so I would love to see that there was in the chat a 3C media has captioning for free. So hopefully, again, we can go back. OK, I like this. This is good information. Someone put that in the resources. Someone put that. I asked the question. I'll, I'll do it when I'm not talking. Um, so anyways, if you want a caption in uh, YouTube, you just in your studio, go to subtitles for a video. Um, you can duplicate and edit the auto captions. And I will say the fastest, most painless way to do these, especially if you're making videos for a fully online course from scratch or even going back and rewatching them, is to just read through and make sure that what is there is what you said. That is a lot faster than going through and making sure, like, to, to rewatch the video means you're going to take twice as long. Um, so that's my fastest workflow is to just read through, especially because I'm not someone who scripts anything. Um, Yes, and of course, um, but we're talking about making your own. Uh, so that's there. Uh, I'll let Juan talk about some low tech options because you already mentioned that IPVO earlier. 
Yeah, and also going back to the to the captioning stuff, um, I think it's that's why it's a little important to make the videos as short as possible, just because then you'll go through a whole bunch of texts and then you're just stuck there. And if you're like me, you know, like I hate hearing my voice, but sometimes I have to do it to just make sure. Um, but I mean, I, I do I do agree with Kelly. I mean, I just look at the text, just to take a look at it, but try to make it as short as possible, just as an FYI. Uh, but yeah, there are low tech options. I mean, Kelly and I use a lot of, uh, we have a really techie computer where we can go ahead and use our stylus and just write on our, on our computer. But if you're not like that, uh, you can always use the IPVO, right? Which is document camera. Um, it's pretty cheap. Um, uh, and it's, it does what it has to do, you know, um, especially if you, if you're a math person or a science person, and you just want to write down things down. I know one of the things that I did, uh, when my people wasn't working, um, I did kind of like a ghetto version of stacking some books together and putting my phone there. So, uh, and then just doing it that way, but then I couldn't move my phone. So I couldn't, there was only, only so much space that I could do. So there was like some neat, uh, little tricks that YouTube were, were uh, a lot of YouTube people were, were putting on how to um, take a video. So uh, there are definitely low tech options. So uh, I think there's a, if you go into the next one, there's a picture of like us. Is there? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. So uh, there's a picture of us just go ahead and doing it. I have a lot of videos uh, with with the TI 36 X Pro, which is a calculator that I use a lot in all my classes. And there's no emulator for that. So we have to use this, uh, uh, the document camera or just using your phone uh, to go ahead and do that. And actually later on, just to a little spoiler, uh, you will see one of my students actually doing it on his phone uh, and how he was able to record um, his work and submitting it. So you'll be able to see a little bit of that. But there are some low tech options as well in case you don't have this fancy computer. Yes. Um, and I will say that the TI, like the other TI calculators, there are emulators. So you can bring a TI onto your screen. I'm I'm slowly moving away from that. All my old lecture videos are very TI heavy and I'm like, Desmos, uh, let's just use technology. Uh, but my most viewed videos on YouTube are all my TI 36X Pro help. I don't like, apparently everybody's looking for help on that calculator. Um, we also want to share some time-saving considerations. So um, I will, I'm going to go ahead and just talk about that second bullet point because Juan mentioned the keeping it short. Uh, just to save yourself a lot in terms of that captioning time too, of like going through your captions. But I mean, you all might be better than me in terms of planning out what you're going to do in a video. I mean, Joellen having a script, that means you knew what you were going to say. That is typically not how I roll. So I will find out, like, I'll do an entire problem and realize I dropped a negative sign or like I just did an answer key for my test and I somehow took the square root of X cubed and said that was X to the one third. I have no, I, I was tired. I have no idea. But instead of having to redo a 30 minute video or edit a 30 minute video to like fix that little chunk, I'm able to re-upload another two minute video and my students are more likely to watch them. So it's easier to deal with a mistake and my students are more likely uh, to. Uh, yes. So Lainey, I do all of my videos in playlists where they're going to get example after example and kind of decide at what point they want to stop watching examples. I usually will cue the next example with a, hey, the next example does something different so that they know like why to stick around and watch another video. Juan? Yes. Uh, sorry, I was replying to chat, um, but you beat me to me to it. So yeah, and perfect is perfect. So I do have a quote over here, but my background is all messed up. So I don't think you'll be able to see it, but it's on my board. Uh, it's one of our instructional designer actually told me that and perfect is perfect because I told her that I, I hated that I would be recording and I didn't like how I entered uh, in the video or I said something wrong. And she was just like, don't worry about it. Just do it. Keep them short. Just go ahead and just um, try, just do what you got to do. Uh, and and it's right. I mean, and a lot of the students do pick up. Uh, I actually uh, had a probability video where I was doing conditional probability and I switched up the events and I was doing it the entire way. And then the students were like, wait a minute, you flip them around. What, what, what does that mean? And you said that they weren't equal. So um, yeah, I mean, those type of things, you know, I go back and I make a little note, hey, you know, there's a video, this, this should actually be this, do a little correction, and then I redo the video afterwards, but uh, imperfect is perfect, just go ahead and just go through with it, even if it's, uh, I, I assure you that it does get better, uh, especially if it's the first time that you're doing a video, um, um, but yeah, uh, what else do I need to say about that? Oh, we're going to mention the collaborate with others, so 
the picture off to the right is um, from a faculty and queer group that Juan and I were on, led by one of our amazing adjuncts, Andrea Steele. And we rewrote our last section of lecture notes for statistics, the two sample, all the two sample material. And instead of each of us going and making 12 videos, we just divided it. We said, okay, Juan, you're gonna do two, two proportions. And I did two means and someone else did uh, difference in means. And so we were able to share the workload and at the same time, create a playlist that our students could see other people who might look more like them or just get a feel for other instructors in case they wanted to take another class. They now had an idea of the personality of another math instructor. So this idea that we're not in this alone and uh, a lot of this is a lot faster, especially if you're going to do a lot of examples, um, if you share that with, with colleagues. Yeah, and it's really good to collaborate with others. I mean, there's been many times where I have a, I needed a video for some particular topic, but, you know, either Kelly has it or some of my other colleagues have it. And it's just really nice to just be able to, like, have this library of a whole bunch of videos um, in there. So. Um, Sorry, I was. You're fine. All right, so we did have a question in the, the chat sort of about how do we, if we have all of these videos, how are we helping students move through them? Um, and so for me, it's a lot, all of these videos, it's never just here's a playlist from YouTube, watch all of them. Um, they're typically embedded uh, within Canvas pages. So this is a review section from my orientation module. Um, and so I might have a, hey, watch these examples, or I might give a little brief intro. And the other question that came up in the chat was Bob mentioning, well, if you write all of this stuff out, it's not really accessible. So typically what I will do in these situations is I will have the, you can't see it because there's the walkthrough is not expanded, but I'll have a walkthrough written in the, the LaTeX within the math type within Canvas that is accessible. So a student who can't watch the video uh, or, you know, can't interact with a PDF with written work on it, still has a way to, to listen to that math that they're gonna maybe miss out on. So um, all of this for me is organized within Canvas pages that have more than just video. And to me, this, this comes back to our students may not all enjoy learning by video. Uh, Michelle knows I'm actually not, I, I don't like learning by video. It's slow to me and I just wanna get to the point. I like to scroll to the end. Like I, I just go to the end. I'm like, is my answer the same? Great. Um, and so uh, for students, I like to have multiple ways for students to engage with the material. And so in this situation, um, they have a formative assessment using H5P, they have a video, they have uh, some written work that they can read through, lots of different options for them to um, review this particular topic. Which takes yes. us to a uh, video for assessment. So let's just go ahead and dive in um both uh h5p is free through the california community colleges through libra text um happy to tell you more about that uh, i'll put that in the resources link um but here is a pre-calculus example from one of my students i saw him today actually uh lucas is one of my students in now he's in my calculus class and asked him for permission to share this with y'all uh and he of course said yes so i'm going to this is a 30 minute video. That's how how into this Lucas got. I'm not gonna show it all to you. Hey guys, this is Lucas. Today I'll be showing and explaining how to solve partial fraction decompositions. I'll be showing using two different methods. The first method is by using systems of equations with this. So I'm not going to make you watch it, but w. Lucas does an amazing job. He did on Squared. every single one of his assignments. That's why actually he was like, I hope you chose one of my earlier ones. I was like, oh, actually, this is week 13. This is not an early one. He's like, they were really good at the beginning. And I was like, I don't have time to change out my example. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to show you the, the sort of prompt for this. Hey, guys. Let me out. All right. Um, so my online students, this is if uh this class was hybrid, but I've done fully online before and it was similar. Uh, my students had to make an instructional video answering this particular prompt, and I gave them some requirements, set up the correct form for the partial fraction decomposition, finish finding A and B by these two different methods we had discussed, and then gave them options for possible extensions uh, so that they could keep going if they wanted to. Um, 
And so my students did this weekly um, in both my classes. Part of the reason I did this is my first time teaching a fully online STEM math class. I taught trig fully online. I found myself giving students like challenge problems to show that they were like act like more conceptual, harder problems and questions where we I randomized the numbers that they were dealing with. And I found myself spending more time grading and my students sort of frustrated because we weren't tackling the same very conceptual questions in class. Um, but I was like, and even then my students could theoretically have a tutor do the work for them. So I didn't care if a tutor helped my student figure out the problem, but I wanted to make sure my student knew what they were doing. And I can tell you from two semesters of doing videos, uh, it is obvious when a student knows what they are doing in a problem and when they do not. Uh, it takes about two minutes of the video to know, uh, not even two, it's pretty pretty straightforward right away. You're like, oh, you just said subtract five from both sides, but you didn't say anything about isolating or explaining. Um, so these, that one was hosted on YouTube. I gave my students a lot of options so they could use Canvas Studio, which we have on campus. Uh, this is another great question. I'm so glad you asked it, uh, Julie. Um, I, again, did not want them uploading the MP4 to Canvas into Canvas's normal video thing because there was no captioning. So I, I did push my students to make sure that they either host it on YouTube or use Canvas Studio since those would provide at least auto captions if another student wanted them. Um, so that's how I had my students. But most of the time, because of how long things took to load when everybody had a Canvas Studio, I tried to push them towards just hosting unlisted on their own YouTube site. Uh, and most of them had that already or had a Gmail account. So that wasn't too big of an ask for them. I will say that example only had, like everybody did the same problem. So there was a little less value uh, in having the discussion board aspect because these were all submitted to a discussion board so that they could learn from each other. Um, so they could watch someone else's good explanation, hopefully have a, a better job and then redo it. Um, but I have used lots of different things to randomize the questions. Um, I've had students just go through and, and create answer answers to the questions in OpenStax, a, walk, a video walkthrough for the OpenStax uh, questions. Um, check it. Uh, there's a lot of great exercise banks available. Um, so if you want like students to do derivatives analytically, you can just have them choose a version. And there's even more if you want to get into it. You can export 999 versions of this into Canvas. So you could have every student doing a unique problem. Uh, does make it a more of a pain to grade because you can't just check to see if the work is correct at the end. But if it's in Canvas, it actually will show you what the right answer is. So as an instructor, it's pretty fast to be like, okay, I know what the right answer is, it's in Canvas. And then let me go watch their video to make sure that they communicated everything uh, properly. And then, uh, like I said, I've done this before with Desmos. I had students just link out to a Desmos classroom activity where all it did was randomize uh, a rational function for them to then be graphing and talking about in their video. I think we'll see this rational function, not this one in particular, but this assignment later uh, when we talk about it. Okay, there's a question for you down there, Kelly. But, uh, but yeah, so I have video as an option. So um, I barely started using video assessments um, just last semester. I like the idea of, of students having to do a video and then working out a problem because they will showcase, you know, whether they really understand it or not. So uh, one of the things that I did in my stats class is that I eliminated basically all of my assessments. So now all they have to do is just gather data for every single uh, like chapter. If it's probability, they gather data, they calculate a mean, they pretend that the population mean, and they do a lot of normal distribution, a lot of different type of things. So they gather data and they have an opportunity to go ahead and show me that they actually know how to do this. So this is actually an example, the, the one on the on the left hand side uh, is a probability example where they have to build a tree diagram and then co convert it to a contingency table. So they have two options, they can either upload a video or they can just go ahead and explain what their events were, uh, how they solve the problem. So that was kind of the alternative assessment. So they had an option to go ahead and do it. Not a lot of students did it because uh, I think that it can be really intimidating in the very beginning. Uh, but I think that's how it was a really good starting point for myself. Uh, before that, I've actually had done it for as an, ex as an extra credit assignment or as an honors project. So over to the right, I have 
uh, this business calculus. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's fine, Kaylee, you're gonna do it. So I gave them the instructions and I also gave them directions on how to create a video. Uh, so they could easily use Screencast-O-Matic. Uh, so in the video that I have here is one of my students, his name is uh, he, uh, Wade, who, uh, it's more low tech. He he was like, I don't know, I don't do technology, but he did it on his phone. So you can watch a little snippet snippet of what he actually did. So you will see him a little bit upside down in the very beginning. So uh, Kelly, go ahead and if you can, please. Good morning, Professor Bernal. I'm going to attempt this extra credit. Bear with my technology. Uh, I have no way to remedy the fact that you're going to be looking at my work upside down. Um, okay, here we go. And it wasn't upside down, just be with upside down. You can fast forward if you want, Kelly, you can see that um, his writing and he was doing a limit problem. So I give him a little bit more complicated limits, one where he can have to foil, one with a really nasty radical. So this was for my business calculus class. So um one okay. training it. Yes, but, but yeah, that's so that's one uh, that's kind of what Wade did uh for this class. Oh. You have to unmute myself. I'm happy to see Wade again because Wade was one of my students who then who then moved on and took uh classes with Juan. Um so I think that answers a really good question in terms of like, what about our students who may not feel as adept at technology? Even if that question wasn't asked, Wade was sort of there answering it for us, telling us like, yeah, I'm going to be upside down. Just, just bear with me. Um, so some, some lessons learned from having done this for a while. One is to start small. Um, starting with an introduction on using video is a great way to sort of low stakes, make sure students are capable of using video. Uh, to do these things. Um, have them do really simple questions at the beginning. My pre-calculus course, I think the very first video they have to make is just like finding the equation for a line between two points. Like it is very, very simple just because I want to make sure that they understand the bar for communication. Um, definitely explaining the options that they can do what my student Lucas did, who was clearly had a tablet, was able to write and make beautiful math on a whiteboard. Um, they can also use their phone. They don't have to write in real time, right? Wade had something to, to use like a phone stand, but I had students in my courses, they would write out all their math ahead of time and then just use their phone and talk about it um, and sort of point to the different steps as opposed to needing a, a free hand to write with. Um, I strongly suggest if you're going to have students make videos, it's a little bit, I don't know, vulnerable for a student to make a math video. And so allowing them the opportunity to make revisions, um, especially if they're not sure about those communication bars they need to meet, that's that's a big important thing in my course for me is that my students can still try again, right? I can ask them to take it a little bit further if they if it was something where they got to choose an example and it was a little too simple, I might say, could you could you add a little bit? What if it had been uh, X squared or something? Um, the rubric, I will show. Oh, I can get you an example rubric uh, in a bit. Um, but yes, yeah, so the rubric for me is usually just a, it's a single point rubric with two things. Was the math correct? Was the communication enough that another because usually the bar is communicate so that a student in our class who had missed the lectures would be able to understand. So that's usually when students fail or not fail. I, I have a, my grading system is that not yet almost in success. Usually when I would almost videos, it was exclusively for a communication issue. Like they just did not explain the why enough of the moves they were making so that I another student would understand, right? If you just say, I'm gonna subtract five from both sides, why did you subtract five from both sides? Um, I really liked using discussion boards because I was able to then um, tell students that like, oh, yours is yours is good. Like, why don't you go watch uh, Muhammad's video? He did a really lovely job of explaining this idea or uh, like so that you can see what the bar is. Um, and then again, um, if you're grading these, watch them at two times speed because otherwise you will hate everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, two times speed makes everything better. And then I do like the idea that Juan shared, which goes back to that universal design for learning, giving students options. 
I use videos in a fully online class because it was one way for me to really ensure that as my students authentic work. Um, but if, if it's not a fully online class, give it as an option, right? And for some students, it's faster, especially for those presentations for a final project to, to they'd rather do a video and talk through what they did as opposed to making a, a report or something like that. All right. Um, I will also, every, every talk I do ends up becoming a talk about renewable assignments because I love them. Uh, so one thing I love about the idea for these video assignments is that a typical assignment, a student, you know, turns it in, they learn from doing it right. We grade it, we learn what they know. They might learn from our feedback. There's a lot happening, right? And the typical assignment has value, but it has no value outside of that student's learning. And so at the end of the day, the student throws away that quiz, looks at that feedback. When the Canvas course is over, they're never going to see that again. Um, but a renewable assignment, which is what I, I view a lot of these videos as, is that this work is valuable beyond the students. Because I'm having students post these videos in a discussion board, other students in the class are learning from that. Taking it further, I can have all my students put these videos into a playlist in YouTube. So now next semester, I don't need to put in 20 examples of something. If students want more examples, I can just put them into that playlist of other examples from their, from their peers. And even better, they now know someone else who looked like me, who also took this class, was able to do this. And so there's a little bit more of that sense of belonging than they're going to get from me making all the same videos uh, as an expert. Um, oh, yeah, well, let me... Do, 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 do. Um, I have not... Christine, this is a great question, this thing about a video submitted to a Canvas quiz. I would do that with the check it probably. For me, though, the value is that they learn from each other. Um, yes, Sandra, I've asked any student who had really good videos, I've asked them if I can use them again. Um, my issue with Canvas quizzes, I would have to make it an essay question instead of a file upload question because downloading a million videos would make me batty. Um, and all of the check it stuff comes in default as file upload. So I usually would have them, hey, here's your question. Please don't upload anything here. Answer, you know, post your answer as, in the discussion board. Um, though it's possible to do it in a Canvas quiz, and you can add rubrics now to Canvas quizzes. So that is a, a possibility. Um, the last thing I think, I hope, the last thing here in the videos for assessment is I've used these in my on-site courses as well. Um, this is a video from uh, my course where... We were, it was a supported intermediate algebra course and we were doing multiple graph transformations. And I was like, you know what? You guys go create a problem that has at least two graph transformations and then make a video showing how to solve it. Uh, the nice thing here was it took a little bit of the technology issue away because only one person had to record. Um, again, there's options you can see even here. Some students use the whiteboard. Uh, some students wrote on paper and then walked through it. Uh, the student who we're about to see. What up, guys? It's Chase. Um, here we got the parent function. Uh, so here's the points. Boom, 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 boom. Come with me over here. Get the low Uzi vertical stretch. So three f of x. So that means with this. So I mean, this is just an example where like we weren't online, but we were still utilizing video. And then they all had these examples that they could use to study for that exam that we were working towards. Uh, I think that takes us to our, our last of our topics, which is using videos for feedback. Uh, this is something I've played around with. Um, and so I'm gonna show you some of the things I've done in terms of that. Since I have video assessments, uh, one of the things I have done is create like reaction videos, like walking through a student's work. Um, this I have done because sometimes it's hard to be like, at minute three, you use the term, like no student is gonna go back and watch that. And it makes me like write that down, probably not gonna happen. So this is one that I made, it's, it's long because Carlos was long-winded, but. All right, I already feel good about this, Carlos. You got an appropriate amount of length of time chosen one of the easier theorems. Uh, you've got a beautiful set of slides with some gorgeous arrows, you know, your usual work. So let's begin. Hello class. On this great contribution, I'm going to explain the factor theorem. Now I need to see if I can figure out where he, he talks about synthetic because there's a point where I'm really going to speed it up. 
the numbers of the polynomial equation. We're not going to take the so you can see me like in real time being like, okay, coefficients. That that's the word you meant. There were a couple of other times where I was like, all of your work is beautiful. Let's let's just help a little bit with this language because you're an A student. Let's take you to an A plus, right? Um, and so. I, I definitely I made this for everyone for one of the assignments. It added a little bit of time, but I think it was a, a nice thing to do kind of early on in terms of here's how I, I want to give feedback. A lot of times it was easier. I was able to just say, hey, this is the move you missed. But um, this was something I toyed around with after seeing something, I think, from Maria Anderson about doing this. And I was like, all right, I can do a reaction video. I can screencast myself watching their video doesn't take any more time then they get to see that I actually am watching each of these videos as painful as it is sometimes to grade them um all right I already feel but more generally I just give general feedback this is something I do in almost every announcement um if I see students sort of going not in the direction I wanted to or a common mistake I will almost always send out an announcement that says hey look we were having some struggles with this. Let me explain another way to enter this particular assignment. So much like Juan, my students had to create a, a dependent event situation. I think we both are at the same port in our statistics class. So that's why these <laughs> came up for us right now. Um, and so I, I just added this video. All right, so let's talk about that module six discussion where I explained like, hey, here's the mistakes you all were making. Like, let me walk you through some of the, some ways that we could have reassessed or re got into that. A particular discussion board. Yeah, so um, I don't do video feedback. Uh, I have, or I haven't tried video feedback. Let's just say that. Um, uh, so when it comes to video, uh, I've also just done very general feedback. Uh, when either when students are having uh, muddy or sticky topics. So if there's a topic that's really, really difficult for students and I can see them on the grades that everyone's like not doing so well, then I can go ahead and do a video. Uh, either to review, do an extra example. But this is something that I did. And let me put a plug in on humanizing online STEM. So uh, it's, a, it's a course that I took last semester. Uh, so which is a bumper video. And the, we use Adobe Express. And it's super duper easy to make. Um, so let's go ahead and play it and see what it, what it looks like. So let's review the different types of sampling that we learned the first two weeks of class. In our class, we learned four different types of sampling methods. The first was a simple random sample, which we call an SRS. The second was systematic sampling. Third was stratified sampling. And fourth was cluster sampling. In an SRS, or a simple random sample, we select a sample completely at random. We're going to watch the whole thing, but you guys... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I really liked about it, it was that it's really short. You can have music around it. You can. There's a lot of different ways that you can play around with different pictures. Everything is free. So I really liked that, that idea. And I used this video again and again, especially because this can also really confuse a lot of students. Uh, and it has pictures, uh, but I do want to kind of advertise how or help Michelle advertise that uh, humanizing online stuff. So if you're interested in, in knowing how to make this, you know, feel free to sign up for that because uh, I think it'll be really worthwhile. So, um, so yeah. All right. And so, I mean, Juan sort of said it, but we talked about video for three specific uses, right? For content, for assessment, and for feedback. But that's not the only place that we should be using video as instructors. Um, I'm going to answer Chloe's question because there, there's some pushback that people may not see if there's no chat on this in the um, the video. Um, there's there's a question here about whether or not video assessments are really a realistic thing to do in the size courses that we typically get stuck with in math. For some reason, people think because you're grading numbers, you can do you can have 46 students in a class. Um, so I have uh, classes of 46. When I did this in my pre-calculus class, I only did it in pre-calculus. Um, I felt fine enough with the stuff in, in uh, statistics that I have an online statistics class with that doesn't use a lot of video. Um, I just, my STEM classes, we, I mean, right now our campus doesn't even allow us to teach STEM classes online, uh, but this was in, in the good days when we had that for a second. Um, and so I had 46 students. I graded, I signed one of these each week. So whatever 46 times 16 is. Um, I have no idea. I refuse to do that math. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm like, nope, simple math is not my thing. You guys can figure that out. But it it was a lot. And so I would say maybe as a recommendation, um, 
doing one every other week, like alternating back and forth between like a nice annotated solution key and a video solution. Um, uh, so that way you're not doing as many, but they weren't that hard to grade. I mean, honestly, I would put them off because I didn't, I don't like watching videos. Uh, but once I went and did them, it would take me less than an hour to get through my class because you're watching them at two times speed. You start learning which students like really have it down and which like, and so you're able to like just skip to like number problem three or, or you see where students are like not explaining the thing you hope to see. Like we didn't talk about isolating this term. I really want to make sure that they did it. So I would scroll through in their video uh, to like that minute three where I could see them isolating the term and be like, okay, did they just say minus five from both sides or did they mention why they did it? And so I could easily just, because it was an almost like or success situation with my single point rubric, just tell a student, hey, you didn't explain like, so it was very quick for me to grade some of them because I knew where I was looking for those communication errors, was able to go to that spot in the video based on the work and then send them that sort of that generic feedback that every student was getting, right? So I wasn't even writing specific feedback to Juan to tell him he didn't explain the moves well enough. I had a very specific like, hey, you didn't, you know, here's what I would hope. Why don't you go look at that everybody was getting that was the same. Um, so it it wasn't as bad as it seems. I totally, I totally understand the trepidation, but it really wasn't as bad as it seems. And then again, if they're making you videos for the next semester, because you have their permission to reuse them, you're saving yourself work later. Um, so some other places to use videos. Um, obviously, if you have a, a liquid syllabus, that's a great place to, to put a welcome video or a welcome letter. Um, any of the announcements, as I've said, especially if there's something where I'm giving feedback, um, overviews, each of those module overview pages, sort of like Juan showed earlier, even putting them into assignment instructions. So students have the written instructions, but they might also want to see a video of you walking through what the steps might look like um, or explaining the purpose, how that assignment fits in with your objectives for the course. Um, any nudges. I send my students a lot of message students who's, and so I will send them YouTube videos with that same hint that I put into the announcement. So if I have that certain like, hey, I see you're still struggling on this or, oh, it doesn't look like you were able to get started on this discussion board. Here's an idea. Watch this video. Um, and then, of course, any sort of module wrap up you have. Uh, these are all nice spaces to just put videos to humanize your course and help students with understanding your content. I think that's the end. Yes. I think so. Yeah. We so I, I know we didn't get anything in the Q&A, but we got a bunch in the chat. So if you have other questions, feel free. Throw them in the chat. Michelle's back. The chat worked great. Um, our audience was not you know, so big that it was overwhelming. So it flowed great and you were on top of everything. I, I, there was one question that may have, I may have missed the answer. Maybe you got to. It was about asking students permission to use their work. Did you get to that one? I did. I answered that. I, okay. I mentioned that. Um, for students who's, who's had beautiful, like, like Lucas, yes, I, I asked them for that sort of like, can I use your stuff in future classes? Because I really love how you presented it. Yes, I have, I have always asked students for that. Perfect. I need yeah. like a generic, like, end of course survey that just says, can I use your stuff? So I'm not having to reach out and be like, specifically you. And I just have like a blanket. Yeah. yeah, I always just put it in the comment section, you know, like after like I grade it, hey, can I use your video? Your video was amazing. Or your project was amazing. Can you go ahead and give me permission? They usually say yes. Unless like, I think I've only had one no, but everything has to be yes. Yeah, I find that students are usually very honored and excited to have know that their instructors are going to reuse their work. So, but yeah, we definitely want to ask their permission. Students do own the, their copyright of their content. And then there's also FERPA issues to consider. So um yeah I think you covered everything I I I would like to have everyone reflect on if there's no more questions like what are you taking away from this can we just do like a a chat response to that if if there's no more questions what's your takeaway or Kelly also in one if you want to loop over and uh, take a look at the the resources if there's anything there that you want to address in that document Okay, we got the session archive. I saw some good, I mean, we didn't have a ton. There was captioning, there was rubrics. Oh, yes. I feel like that was a Michelle with that accessible link about the different rubrics available uh, from the cult of pedagogy. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> yeah, single point rubrics are, are 
game changers, at least they were for me. So I want to be sure folks know what they are after you said that. And reassessment, like it used to make, like when you give regular points, it's hard because you have to just, you feel like you're justifying every point you take off or give, but when you're just saying, Hey, you could do better. It's a, it's such a different way to give feedback. And like, it opens up a whole different, like way of talking to your students. And then you don't have to worry. Like the grading is fast because I'm just like, yeah, yeah, you're not there yet. Here's, here's how you could fix it. The one thing I will say is that when I tell students to kind of come back, um, Yes, and Joellen, that's my friend uses video extensively, especially with peer instruction and SES course. So I, I email me or, or I'll make a note and I'll get you her contact stuff. Um, I've lost my train of thought because I was so excited by the <laughs> chat. Um, oh, I was going to say that I try not to tell them to make the whole video again, right? Like I try to, because I realize that they've already invested a lot of time, especially if like Lucas had had a mistake or something in that 30 minute video. Um, I might just say, hey, can you make a follow-up video explaining this step? So typically that was how I asked mm -hmm. them to get to that two points because my things are zero, one, or two to get to that success is not redo the whole video. It was, can you make a clarifying video about this move you made or something right. you did? Fill in the gaps, great. Um, and there's that question about how, for me, I'll let Juan, I think his were just mostly options. They're all part of other assessments. Can you read um, that? Because that, that actually just came yeah. out to the hosts and panelists. Yeah. Oh, okay. It says, um, are points attached to the video assessments and how do these assessments figure into the course grade? Uh, and so for me, points were attached to the video assessments. Um, my pre-calculus course is more of a standards base. So this was one of three ways that students were showing me they understood the topics for a week. And um, they were essentially a third of their grade. Um, if you thought about each of those pieces that they did throughout the week, there was a written piece, there was a video piece, and then there was like a auto graded quiz piece. And they were all the same amount of points uh, to show their understanding of a particular topic. Yeah, and since mine were just options, you know, like uh, the only thing that I did run was when I did get an option on giving a PDF and explanation versus a video. Now I had to have two different rubrics for both. So it can be a little bit confusing, but I think uh, as, I, as I'm as i seeing a lot of the uh, the chat, uh, feel free to not do everything that we do, you know, just do one small thing. Uh, you know, I know for a fact, I know Kelly does a lot of video, way more video stuff than I do. So um She's crazy, but I mean, she's also like amazing, uh, but also just uh, do what you can, you know, do little small things, you know, start giving them as an option, you know, so I think the, just getting small little doing small little things in the beginning uh, will go a long way. Um, I like Christine's question, too. So if you'll notice the two student videos I share, this question here says, um, have you tried just audio recordings? I would be fine with that as well. Um, mostly though, my students don't have to be on screen, just like I don't have to be on screen to make my lecture videos. So um, the two videos I showed with Lucas with his his writing on his thing um, and Carlos with his slides that had auto advancing sort of like math, those did not, I mean, they never had to show their face in those videos. Um, and so same thing with Juan. I mean, Wade showed his face because he's Wade. Uh, that's what he would do, of course, but it's not, it was not a requirement. It's more just audio with the, the content. So uh, that should be fine to have it separate too. Uh, the one slide that had a, it's the tab spreadsheet. I'm going backwards. It's going to be slow. I think you're talking about my my tabs in Canvas. This, perhaps. That's what I thought too. Uh, yeah, this is just Canvas uh, tabs. They they are they're a pain to muck around with with HTML but they can make a page look less dauntingly long. Um, and I've actually learned since then, I, I usually use my tabs, the tabs as header levels, but then I used it on mobile and they don't, I, I'm like, now I'm changing things, but still um, they, they're just a nice way to like have content look less overwhelming on a page. Um, so tabbed page examples, uh, throw that into the, the resources page and I will get you some Canvas Commons links to copy over. For, for tab pages if you if you want to muck around in HTML, which I believe any math instructor can handle. Nice. All right. I think then 
Yeah, it looks like you covered everything there. I'm going to jump in real quick since Juan was so kind to bring up the Humanizing Online STEM Academy, which thank you for acknowledging. Um, that project, uh, in case there is anyone interested out there, it is a grant funded project that is has limited capacity. And so we do have openings now for the partner colleges that are part of the grant, but they're it's not open to everybody. Um, so I'm sorry for that, but I am going to put that chat in the link if you want to see if your college is on there. Um, you can learn more about it uh, by clicking on the link in the chat. Thank you so much once again, Kelly and Juan. Folks, we're going to have the archive of this session available for you in just a couple of days. Um, and for now, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up and wish everybody a happy Friday afternoon and St. Patrick's Day. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Uh, thank you for that coming. Was fantastic. See you later, folks.